Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and we're still in Oklahoma. We've come north from Oklahoma City about 30 miles to the town of Guthrie. Joining me today is Dr. Andrew Schaefer. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us here today. Pleasure. We are in the Scottish Rite Auditorium here in Guthrie, and if that sounds familiar, uh, Dr. Schaefer, took us through the Scottish Rite Auditorium in uh, St. Louis back last year, and there's a complete video of that. Now there's a video, two videos about the organ, but then there's one video, Andrew, where you explain what it's like to be a Scottish Rite Mason and exactly. why they need music and why they need right. big halls like this. First of all, tell us about the hall we're in. Well, this building was constructed in 1920. Actually, the cornerstone was laid in 1920, and they finished it in 1922, and by finish, I mean that the roof and the doors and the windows were on the place. It was then decorated from 1922 until 1929. And this auditorium is the crown jewel of the building. It seats uh, several thousand people, and it contains this magnificent 1926 Kimball pipe organ that's used to accompany the Masonic degrees. Now we've been working here all day. It's very hot in here. There's no air conditioning. Uh, working on some other projects and we're excited to get to show you this organ. Now you saw, I hope you saw, the Kimball organ uh, in the Scottish Rite in St. Louis. If not, there's some videos linked down in the description as well as uh, Andrew's explanation of Scottish Rite life uh, in that building and what it's used for. Uh, but now I'm ready to hear some of this organ and see how it compares with that other Kimball. They're very similar in age, right? This one's 1923? 1926, yes. 1926. They are very okay. similar in age, but they are very different in their design. Okay. And I think it's best we just go through step by step to show some of those differences. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess um, one of the ways that um, we demonstrated the other Kimball was through just the families of stops. The divisions are here. They're more like a traditional classical organ. We have a great swell choir and pedal and then a solo division on top. But um, let's start with the diapason colors. What do we have in this organ? Exactly, and I'll just, I'll just throw out there, if you're looking for classical choruses that are mm -hmm. all in proportion to each other, you've come to the wrong organ. <laughs> but this organ can, um, uh, is capable of some beautiful chorus work, and I'll show you how to accomplish that. I'm gonna start actually in the choir division. We have uh, a viola diapason. It's really quite lovely, it's actually my favorite diapason stop on the whole organ. So pretty stringy in tone. That's actually the only diapason in the choir oh, really? division. Just that eight foot stop. Right, there is a little violina, but I would classify that That's as a string. string. Well, moving up the keyboards, let's go to the great division. We start with a double open diapason at 16 foot. Nice and woolly. Moving to the eight foot open diapason. And not the greatest diapason if you want to play um, Bach on it. Very fundamental in and a very dark, very heavy sound there. Uh, we have a second open diapason at eight. It's a little lighter. That's actually an extension of the double open. There's also a four foot octave. There is a 12th and a 15th, but they're more string light in tone. And I'll get to those in a second. Putting together the double open, the eight foot and the four foot together. And just for kicks, I will add the 12th, the 15th, and the mixture in it. You could barely hear them come on, yeah, could I, you? I was going to say that that mixture sounds a lot like the Kimball in St. Louis, where it's it doesn't really fit on top of the, the principal chorus because it's so big and heavy. Exactly, and, and it has a lot of spice in it. I'll play it by itself. 
the cameras, or if the microphones can pick it up, it actually has tierces and septiems wow. in it, or a tiers and a septiem, I shouldn't say, <laughs> um, which really makes it very spicy. Well, you might be asking, did those, um, those idiots in Chicago not know how to build a principal chorus? Well, they did. It was just a whole different concept. The mixtures on this organ, of which there are two, are designed really as color stops. And they're actually supposed to be used with strings and flutes just to add a little bit of spice, um, like so. Or with the string. And actually, that mixture really... Um, yeah, the, the, and the softer nature of the, those softer stops gives the mixture more... They don't bury the mixture so much with their volume. So. Exactly. And when we get to the swell, I'll show you how that mixture works really well with the strings, just to kind of reinforce all of the, the upper harmonics. Well, so there. that's all of our principal voices on the grate. So let's show us what we have on the swell as far as sure. the principal diapason sound. We have one lonely diapason, uh, but it's a big boy. It's a diapason phonon. Diapason phonon was a concept that was pioneered by Robert Hope Jones. Uh, this particular one uh, has leathered upper lips, really thick um, uh, lead, and uh, I think it's linen lead that they used for that. And so it has, again, a very uh, woolly uh, uh, sound to it. <laughs> And if you add the supercoupler to it, you can actually get a pretty nice eight and four foot sound. So I have a couple of questions. The first is, uh, is that a 73 note stop? Was it meant to be used all the way up like Let's that? Let's find out. All right. Here it is with the unison off and this four foot. goes all the way up. So that was kind of an, a design idea, was instead of having a separate exactly. four foot, they expected you would use the swell super. Exactly. And if you go up in the top octave, you've got those extra notes. Mm -hmm. so. And that's true of all the eight foot stops. Oh, okay. Four. My other question is, how does that, that phonon diapason compare to the great first in, in well, volume sure. and in, in quality? is just a little bit brighter. It's a little brighter, but they're very similar still in attack exactly. and, and, and in that darkness. Yeah. Yeah. And we um, are at the console, which is all the way to the right of the auditorium, of course, uh, for those of you watching at home. And so it's not the most advantageous place to actually listen to this organ. So it great may sound a little bit uh, more live in the room. But uh, yeah, they're both pretty, pretty heavy-duty stops. Uh, we have one more diapason that's the biggest of them all the center phone in the solo division. And if you thought that diapason phonon was something else, <laughs> uh, just wait till you hear this one. Here it is with the super. They all sound like together. Yeah, let's see what we can do. We can all right, here's here. the. These are all the eight foot diapasons. Eight foot diapasons on the entire organ. boxes you can close it down it's surprisingly exactly. a wide range of, of sounds you've got there so that's yeah. that's really handy now every the the swell choir and solo are enclosed the grate is not is that correct great and the pedal are enclosed everything is enclosed entire organ is enclosed. oh wonderful so yeah you really can close down those big diapasons and i did forget about a very important diapason oh, no. there is an oh, open wood in the pedal, the pedal thank you for reminding me <laughs> This organ has no real 32 foot originally. Um, there is a 32 foot up there that was added in 2000. Um, but uh, that was one of the big, biggest pipes in the organ when it was installed. And it's all the way um, on the wall of the great chamber. I'm going to say, we didn't say this in the beginning. This organ is tonally 
exactly as yes. it was when it was installed. I'm very careful to use <laughs> for the purists out there, of which I am one of them. Uh, this organ is tonally unaltered, uh, as far as we know, uh, over the years. This organ has been maintained all throughout its life. It's been in use all throughout its life, so um, we are really grateful for that. And it's, it's used for many events, including reunions, um, concerts, weddings, all sorts of events. Um, and there are actually two other temple organists, uh, Chuck Belknap and, and G. Mark Caldwell, uh, that share the duties. Uh, so yes, the organ was, uh, is totally unaltered. In, in 2000, the relay was starting to fail, and uh, uh, a proposal was, was put together to replace the relay with a modern digital one. Um, I, I begrudgingly am thankful for that because it made things like uh, recital programs a lot easier to register. Um, the relay is still upstairs. If anyone ever wanted to reconnect it, uh, made sure to, to do that. But uh, it was done by McCreary, Mark McCreary um, here of Oklahoma. So the relay was replaced and uh, they also added two stops, a trumpet en chemin that was formerly at Boston Avenue United Methodist Church. It was built by Moeller in the 1960s. Uh, that's named Solomon's Trumpet. It's in the solo division. Um, and then there's a, they added a real 32-foot reed, which the organ was always admittedly lacking. Uh, and those pipes were made by uh, Walker of England. And it's, they somehow got it up <laughs> into the chamber. I don't know how. I'm sure there are pictures somewhere. Um, but uh, for the sake of this video, we're going to stick to the original we'll Kimball stuff. I just want to hear the Kimball stuff. Yeah. Well, when people talk about Kimball, the thing I always hear is the strings. The strings. So let's talk about the strings in this organ, because there's, there's a number of them. Quite a few, yes. I'm going to start actually uh, going from mezzo or from piano to uh, forte. Okay. So in the swell, we have just a solitional and a voix celeste. Also, a viola and a viola celeste in the swell. The solitional and the voix celeste. I can tell you added the solitional and the Vassalest there to the first two reads, but those first two are so big, so much bigger than those others, that's really what's carrying that sound. Exactly, um, exactly. Th they're more of a forte string as opposed to those, but then, yeah, you can add the supercoupler, so we get two octaves more. And we have sound. that other uh, mixture that I was talking about. This hmm. is a cornet of five ranks. Spicy. Yeah, but very soft too. But very soft. Here's what happens. I'm going to put on the viola, viola celeste, the solitional, the voix celeste, uh, and then it, it, I'll play it by itself. With the cornet. Really add some it nice upper some brightness, yeah. A harmonic flute. Okay. Moving, um, the choir actually doesn't have um, a string with an undulant. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the flutes, uh, and we'll get to those in a little bit. It actually has a violina at four. And a contra viol at 16, which is really, really keen. Does the four-foot violina, is that intended to go with the uh, eight-foot, the, the violin de Pazin? Well, let's try it. I'm not convinced. No, it's not like it's adding a, a four-foot <laughs> octave, but it, it could go together to brighten it a little bit. I don't think that's what it was intended for. Exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, it is nice... Yeah, 
adds a little bit of uh, clarity yeah, in the ensemble if you need it. Well, now you do have a dolce stop. Um, sometimes that's a string, sometimes it's a flute. Some, it depends yeah, on it's what in the gray zone. We'll yeah. have to go up and look at its right. construction to see mm -hmm. what it, But let's listen to it and see what we, see what we think. A true hybrid to me. It's kind of a gems horny sort of. Well, well, now that sounds more like a flute Celeste when you add the one to exactly. So maybe it's a maybe it's a. We'll have to go up and look at it and see yes, what, yeah, what yeah. we actually have. The great debate. <laughs> um, now moving to the great division, we actually have um, a gems horn, um, which is a uh, hybrid. Depends on who you're talking to. We also have a gamba at eight foot, and this is really pungent. And here in lies the true um, way to play a Kimball organ. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, or at least <laughs> the way I think you should play a Kimball organ, and I do think that this is how it was intended to be done. As I mentioned before, the principal chorus is, is pretty dull by itself. Here's the eight and four just for um, um, our memory's sake. Here's what happens when I add the gamba to it. Quite a bit clearer. Now, here's what happens when I add the, have the gamba and the eight foot open diapason with the, four, with the um, super coupler on. could actually sort of get away with Bach on that. Let's try it. You at least hear the inner voices. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not than it's, I could. It's, 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 no one's going to confuse it with... Uh, with with the know, Taylor booty, yes, right. right. But, um, <laughs> but it's clear. You can but it, it is clear there. <laughs> and so that's where a lot of the brightness with Kimball organs come from, is the string tone. Uh, and, and then we have the granddaddy of them all, the cello and the cello celeste. And these, um, these are uh, vintage, vintage Kimball sounds. Um, let me get some proper things in the pedal here. sumptuous sound is when you get all of the strings going at once <laughs> with the undulants. I'm going to throw on the flute celeste too. Why not? Okay. You, gotta, you only live once here. Yeah, amazing array of string colors. Exactly. That we just don't hear on modern organs anymore. And I think it enough. should be, um, <laughs> I think it uh, should be noted too that uh, Wanamakers, uh, mm. Wanamakers, and if you don't love the sound of Wanamakers, <laughs> there's something wrong with you. And everyone who loves the organ uh, should be able to appreciate that sound. And many of the strings on that organ were actually mm -hmm. built by the Kimball Company. Um, and so that classic Wanamaker sound can be sort of recreated um, through the use of. Uh, same types of strings. Now, you, there are a couple of strings in the pedal we didn't talk about, correct? Some really edgy, bright things? Yeah, and most of these are uh, from the manuals themselves. Okay. The, the contra viol is, is from the choir. And the viol, viol alone is actually an extension of this cello. Yeah, they're pretty 
pretty pungent so in themselves. 16 foot octave. Yeah. Okay, but it's nice that they're there at 16. Exactly. Uh, ready to be your your stringy string right. bass down there. Good. Well, I guess that takes us to the flutes now. We've talked about a few of them, but let's see what we've got. Yeah, uh, I'm going to start in the choir division. We have a concert flute. And a flute celeste, since we're talking about strings. What a nice way to bridge the gap. So, and, um, this is kind of close to like a, a, a bois celeste, and it's a yeah, it's really, very gentle. really lovely sound. Um, Of course, you've heard the Undamaris and the, the Dolce. And there's also a little forest flute here. Not exactly sure what that construction is. Oh, we'll find uh, out. We'll find out when we go upstairs. Um, on the Great Division, <clears throat> we have a uh, regular old Melodia. Special about it, but I love this stuff. And then a Tibia Klausa. Of 1926, after all. And in 2000, when they put in the, the relay, we actually had it extended to four foot. I should say, not we. Yeah. I didn't do it. Someone <laughs> else did it. But it is a useful stop at four foot. It's not hurting anyone up there. There is a tremulant. Unfortunately, the tremulant's not working today, but it does trem like a tibia should. And I want to point out something about a tibia that um, you might wonder, well, what is that lonely little stop doing on a classical organ? Well, actually, you can use it. it I, I always think of tibias on a classical organ like starch. Um, they take whatever stop you've got and then just make it bigger. They don't change really the tone so much as it, it just takes a sound. So here um, I'm going to I'm going to sneak and go into the reed family. Here is my uh, orchestral clarinet. Now Kimball clarinets usually don't need anything more than that because they're just gorgeous stops all in themselves. Well, let's hear what it sounds like when I add the tibia to it. Here it is with the tibia. Broaden the sound a little bit. Well, that makes some sense. The tibia is mostly just fundamental. fundamental yeah. There's not a lot of upper harmonics, so the clarinet providing a lot of the same upper color, no matter what the rest of it's doing, but the tibia is giving it just a little more kick through the screens there. Exactly. And here's a little trumpet. Uh, I shouldn't say little. Here's a harmonic trumpet <laughs> on the gray. A little more foundation. Yeah. yeah. So the tibia clausa, uh, it far more useful um, than, it, than at first blush on a classical organ like this. Moving to the swell, we have a um, 16-foot Borden, a uh, foot Clarabella, which is an open flute, and a stop flute. Almost get away with failing on it. Almost, yeah. I, I like you've got sort of a darker flute because usually the Clarabella I expect a little brighter, but that one's kind of dark. It is very dark. But you've got that brighter stop flute to mm -hmm. counter it, so that's nice. Yeah. And then the uh, harmonic flute at four. His mother taught it very well. It plays well <laughs> with both stops. I'll play it here by itself and then with the other stops. Here it is with the Clarabella. Or with the stop flute. Actually, one of my favorite sounds on this organ is when you add the 16 foot board in, stop flute, and the four foot harmonic flute, put on the unison off and the super coupler. Get an eight, four, and two yeah, when you don't have bright. a two foot flute there. Good. Now we'll move to the solo. All the fun stuff is in the solo. Of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, we will have a solo flute, and I swear, you close your eyes, you picture a real flautist up there chained playing whenever I call upon him or her to do it. Ooh. <laughs> 
A little bit of chiff on there, just a little bit of a tap. A little breath in the pipe, that's, that's really nice. Um, there's also a mellow phone, which is just, it's, it's essentially a gross flute. We'll show you up in the chamber. I regret to inform you the mellow phone is um, feeling mellow today and uh, is not up to playing. Um, actually, I've known this organ for six years. I've never ho heard the mellow phone actually play. Um, there's a problem with the chest. Uh, and uh, mm. while this organ does get regular maintenance by the Red River Organ Company, um, I, we, we get it tuned and, and fix winding problems, but we're still working on getting funding for some uh, bigger scale projects. Perhaps someday then. Well, very yes. good. Well, we have a number of colorful reeds in this instrument. Too. Yes, literally, the stops yes. are red. Uh, <laughs> and I will say that these are replacement stops done when the um, system mm -hmm. was done. These are not gimbal stops. So, um, All right, well, since we've been starting in the choir, I think we should continue yeah, that tradition. That there. uh, there's only two reeds in the choir, orchestral oboe. That's a really thin, I mean, orchestral oboes are skinny, yeah. but that one almost sounds like a, a ranquette or a kinura <laughs> color. Is that time, really bright? Time for more sphalic. Yeah. Not quite there, but it is really skinny, and it cuts, yes, cuts yeah, through right. the ensemble really well. Uh, well, here's, here's a more full-bodied mm -hmm. stuff, the orchestral clarinet. Nice and smoky. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the tenor range, so uh, only color reads in the choir. There's no no trumpet or any tuba like that. We're going to the great. We have an independent trumpet chorus, uh, starting with the double trumpet. The notes in there, um, of course, full length. I mean, cheap out in that. A harmonic trumpet at eight. Independent clarion. Hmm. Here I'll build the chorus eight, sixteen, and four. so great that you can close all of that down exactly. and great all that power and yet you can make it just a little whistle yeah. there. It's pretty fiery uh, reeds yeah. which, which really nice they kind of pierce through. Of course 1926 Oregon we have the ubiquitous mm. Vox Humana and Vox Vibra and of course that pairs particularly well with the strings. The tremolo is being extra um, trimmy right now. But. Effective. Contrafogato, of course, full length. Okay. Actually, this makes a really nice color read at eight foot. And that conjures up that, that thin orchestral oboe sound when exactly. it's played up there. Um, that gives you, it makes me think theater organ. Can you're a buzzy stops. But exactly. It's colorful and you can use it in lots of different ways. Yeah. And then a, a cornopian. And a clarion, all independent. Of course, a chorus oboe. And then uh, the pedal, I will just say, that's all duplex borrowed from the okay. manual, so there's, there's no independent read in the pedal. Um, the only independent pedal stop, actually, uh, is, is common in a lot of organs this size, with a lot of 16-foot tone on the mm -hmm. manual. Uh, is the open diapason and the open wood, and also the 16-foot um, board, in which is extended up through eight. All right, so lots of red in the solo division. Mm -hmm. 
uh, both color reeds and uh, a sumptuous tuba chorus. Oh, wow. I'll start going piano to forte, uh, starting with that English horn. Here it is in contrast to the orchestral oboe. Here's the English horn. Yeah, it's got that more characteristics shape that, uh, yeah. that, that that resonator gives. I think of it makes it skip some of the harmonics and just a few of them exactly. stick out. And um, a French horn. Fairly convincing. Yeah. I wouldn't say not quite as convincing as uh, as a Skinner. Um, it's still a big French horn sound, but it's still round, a really beautiful big round sound. Yeah. A lot of wind pressure to make that little <laughs> muted sound, as you can imagine. All right. All right. Now for the, the thing everyone's been waiting for, the tuba chorus. We have um, uh, you know, pick your poison. We have a tuba sonora at eight. That's not enough. We have a tuba mirabilis if you need a bigger one. An independent tuba clarion. So that goes all the way up. <laughs> if you should need it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The things we spent our money on in the 1920s. Um, a luxurious to its core, deluxe. And then the tuba profunda. These tubas have a little bit of dust in them, but um, here's the tuba chorus. Here's all four tubas on at once. That's amazing. You don't need much. Uh, very, very dark. It's um, dark, but it's still it's there, and it's not overbearing, and it, but it cuts through really well. I like it. Exactly. Well, one of the things that uh, makes this organ classical is its lack of percussions. Uh, we mm -hmm. only have two. Uh, set of chimes. And then um, harp. Cellist, which plays an octave higher. And that's all she wrote. All that's right. our Kimball organ. That's the whole organ. Well, it's an amazing instrument, and I'm so glad it is still here playing. Exactly. Uh, and um, I can't wait to go look around and see what it looks like inside. Yeah, and I will add this is one of two um, Masonic Kimballs uh, in the state of Oklahoma. It has a, a younger, a, uh, yeah, a younger and smaller um, sibling at the McAllister Scottish Rite in the south uh, east corner of the state, um, which is a very unique instrument in its own right. That's from the 1930s. But uh, Perhaps we'll make another visit there soon next exactly. time we're in Oklahoma. Getting up to the organ chambers requires coming up some stairs from the auditorium. We were already up one level, now we're going up a couple more. Past the security system here. And we find ourselves on essentially the third floor of the auditorium. We can see out into the auditorium here. Now we're at the level of the choir loft here. We're still not actually up at the level of the organ chambers.
So I'll show you this real quick. This is a choir loft. I don't know what the hell this is. And of course, it's locked and I don't have a key. We are actually uh, two stories up, uh, right under the proscenium arch on top of the stage. And this small space is actually the choir loft. The temple had a choir up until the 1960s. It was SATB, and meaning that they had women in the choir. And so they had an organist who could play and accompany the choir. This console has, uh, you can still play it, controls part of the Great and Swell division alone. It's only a two manual console. The concept of the choir loft here was that the choir could be heard but not seen. And in the days before the public address system, they couldn't hear what was going on downstairs. So they would have someone up here telling them when to sing uh, what, uh, and they would sing just incidental music that would add drama to the, the stage productions downstairs. So it's pretty secluded up here, even though you are technically part of the auditorium. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this organ's uh, sister in McAllister has uh, the same concept, uh, complete with swell shades that you can manually close uh, to uh, shut out the choir when they're not in use. So we're, um, and over there you can see the bottom of the 32 foot reed that was added. We did not include that on our tour. It's not uh, currently winded right now. It's having some issues. Again, that was um, an addition that was done in 2000 by Mark McCrary. So we're gonna climb some ladders and get up to the organ chain. So now we go up another set of stairs and that gets us up to the level of the organ chambers or almost there. Our first stop is at the top of the proscenium arch and the organ chambers are still up there behind those brown shutters. We still have another level to go. The first room we come into is the blower room. This is the blower for the entire organ and the static regulator. Here we turn around and we enter the solo chamber. And this is a very spacious chamber. You can see most of the reeds right here in front. And up on the walkboard, we see the stick used for leveraging up the resonators of the pedal pipes. We saw the same thing in the St. Louis Kimball. Our solo tubas are right here in front. We see the French horn and the stentor foam. And over on the other chest, we see our English horn and the mellow foam. And we leave the chamber and we're out on catwalks in a space uh, over the proscenium. In the back of this little walkway, there's a door that opens up and lets you see down into the stage area itself. You can see the sets and this is how they actually brought the organ up from the stage floor. We continue across and now we are looking into the swell division. This is a little more crowded than the other side. See our orchestral oboe there. Some of the mixtures. And lots of strings. This interesting walkboard that goes up so you can access the swell shades on the wall. That comes from the bottom octave of the clarabella. The eight-foot clarabella is open all the way down. And then there's another chest on the other side, and this side has two layers. This is the lower layer. It contains our trumpets, and our 16-foot fagato is there in the back. 16-foot borden is against the wall. And this is on the walkboard of the upper chest on this side of the swell. We see our strings and our open flute and our stopped flute. 
Now we're back out. We're going to walk around this chamber on the catwalk. If you look in here, there's a little trap door. And I've done it once and I will never do it again. It's where you go into the center arch. <laughs> and then you crawl around, literally crawl, and change all the tiny little light bulbs. Right, right. Now we are walking into the choir chamber. We're up on the walkboard here. Again, the room is divided into two main chests on either side. There is the original relay, all unattached, but still here in case it ever wanted to work again. Look at the beards on these strings. And then on the other side of the room, And I know this isn't great camera work right here, but I was busy trying to figure out what our Dolce and Undamaris were. And what we finally determined was the Dolce is actually a Dulciana, cylindrical, skinny, sort of small principle. And the Undamaris is actually a tapered pipe, like a gem's horn. So that answered our questions from the tour earlier. These are some of the cleanest 100 year old organ chambers I've ever seen. So we're back out on the catwalk overlooking the proscenium arch below us. We're going to go over into the great and pedal chamber. See, there's a little tuning keyboard here so that a tuner can help uh, from up here directly next to the chambers, but Andrew told me they don't use that very much. So then we step down onto the walkboard of the grate and we can see the big diapason there with the wide mouth with leather lips. 16-foot open is right here next to the door. It's hard to see. There's our open diapason and our gamba on the great chest. Eight foot back behind it. We've gone across to the other chest. And then walking behind that one, here's where our reeds are for the great as well as the tibia, which is back there. And there's a shot of the harp next to the soil shades. There are some speakers from something that used to be electronic in here, but nobody knows what those were for. There's the bottom octave of the 16-foot diapason in the grate. The zinc on these pipes has turned a very interesting dark shade. It's normal for them to change a little, but this is much darker than anything I've seen before compared to the spotted metal. There's our 16-foot open, the top end of it. And we're back out on the chamber, and we head back down to the auditorium floor. Andrew, thank you for showing us this wonderful 1926 Kimball organ. It's great to hear all those original sounds still here playing in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Um, the reason we haven't been playing it much more than you're, you're going to hear in this video is because we are here today recording for the Oregon Historical Society's Kaleidoscope of Sound, and Dr. Schaefer is one of the recitalists. The convention this year is all virtual, so they are pre-recording events, and they'll be putting them online. And uh, Andrew, yours goes on August 22nd, is that correct? Five. 
5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So we'll link to Kaleidoscope of Sound, and you'll be able to hear uh, the music that he played today, uh, some fantastic music by Masonic composers uh, on a Masonic organ, and it all sounded wonderful. I can't wait until we can share it with you. Uh, for now, if you want to see uh, Dr. Schaefer's explanation of what it's like to be in a Scottish Rite Cathedral and what all the rooms are for, uh, there's a link to that video from our trip to uh, the Scottish Rite in St. Louis last year. And just for our uh, sponsors, we've done a little tour of this building. We had some time to go around with cameras, and uh, Andrew talks about all the amazing rooms. The tour in St. Louis was informative. This one was amazing because this is the most beautiful building I've ever seen in Oklahoma, certainly, uh, as a gem of the state. And I hope you will come visit it sometime when you're in Guthrie uh, and come hear this organ uh, and, uh, and come see that. But if you're a sponsor of the Oregon Media Foundation, we'll be sending out a link to that video. If you're not one, you can become one today for just $1. Go to Oregon.media and click on support and we'll send you the link to that video. Uh, and you can see a behind the scenes tour here at the uh, Scottish Rite Cathedral. For now, remember you can get straight Streaming classical organ music 24 hours a day on our three streaming stations, OrganLive.com, Positively Baroque, and The Organ Experience. Until next time, I'm Brent Johnson.